מילה ריקלין, בת שמונה, רוסיה. עמנואל דיאקובצקי, 5 years old, אוקראין. חנה רבקה יוספוביץ', 5 years old, הונגרי. A child is a gift to their parents, a light of the future. So therefore, it is hard to speak of the abuse of an innocent child. It is harder to speak of the death of an innocent child. And it is harder yet to speak of of the death of an innocent child who was murdered. One million and five hundred thousand innocent Jewish children were murdered during the Holocaust. Historian Howard Zinn said, there is no flag big enough to cover the shame of killing innocent people. And yet, Who more innocent than children? One of the monstrous acts of World War II was the Nazis' deliberate plan to destroy the future of the Jewish race by destroying Jewish children. Unprecedented in the history of mankind, the Nazis cruelly designed the complete destruction eradication of the Jewish people. It became known as the final solution. How could one counter these demonic plans, this industrialized killing machine, and yet at the heart of its resistance, at the heart of this darkness, was a resistance. a resistance of great pain, courage, and sacrifice. It included the victims, the few rescuers, and the righteous Gentiles. One such righteous Gentile, Raoul Wallenberg, he was faced with a moral dilemma. He could only save or rescue a limited number of people who were destined on a transport to the death camps. He chose to save the children. To those he left behind, he begged forgiveness, saying, I am choosing to rescue the future of the Jewish nation. To the parents, they could face the unthinkable. separating from their beloved children to put them safely on the kinder transport. And yet before Hitler came to power, German Jews were some of the most assimilated in Europe, integrating into all aspects of cultural, social, and political life. They were doctors, lawyers, teachers, politicians, students, soldiers. All that changed in 1933. In the first year of Hitler's dictatorship, the Nazis pledged to persecute the Jews. They instituted the fiercely discriminating racial laws known as the Nuremberg Laws. They were designed to ostracize and then over time to completely eliminate the Jewish population from public life and then from all life. Over 400 laws were decreed, decreed to separate the Jews 
who the Nazis called parasitic vermin from the Aryan race. And emblematic of this horror was the wearing, the forced wearing of the yellow star, the shock of this new reality. The discriminatory racial laws, they progressed slowly in severity. They included the exclusion of Jewish professionals from most civil service positions, then the boycott of Jewish businesses, the prohibition of intermarriage, the denial of public access to transportation, buses, trams, the denial of access to public spaces, including parks or benches, and then the forced removal of Jews to the ghettos. And finally, the confiscation, the stealing, and the destruction of Jewish property, which culminated in the night of broken glass. The Germans called it Kristallnacht. And what of the suffering of the innocents, the children? While the grown-ups in Jewish families were working hard, frightened, losing their livelihoods, the children suffered too. They were no longer allowed to go to playgrounds, gymnasiums, movies. Their teachers were encouraged to bring them to the front of the class and point out imaginary racial differences designed to humiliate them. And on November 15th, 1933, no Jewish child was allowed to attend public school in Germany. And yet this was just the beginning. Jewish children suffered in so many ways. Each new blow was designed to shatter their sense of security, shatter their world, and a child's world it can be fractured in so many ways, big and little. Seven-year-old Ursula Rosenfeld, her world collapsed when not one schoolmate showed up for her birthday party. Jack Hellman's world instantly collapsed when just on the way to his school, as all boys do with his satchel, he was surrounded by his schoolmates and beaten mercilessly. He had to be hospitalized. The Nazi killers smashed the world of the child, and then they smashed the child, sometimes with their bare hands, ripping them from their mother's arms, tearing them from everything they knew their mamas, their papas, their brothers, their sisters. And they sent them alone to the death camps. In defiance of this surrounding horror, in the middle of this long night, there appeared flickers of light when some heroic and selfless Jewish and non-Jewish men and women emerged. And at great danger and at great risk of their own lives and the lives of their families, they stood to resist such evil and helped as many Jews as they could escape. Over 27,000 non-Jews from 51 countries stood alongside their Jewish brothers and sisters, and they are now recognized at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel, and they are known as the righteous among nations. A few of them are... Irina Sendler, 
a Polish nurse, risked her life to help rescue and save Jewish children out of the Warsaw Ghetto. She masterminded risky rescue operations. Under the pretext of inspecting sanitary conditions during a typhoid outbreak, she and her assistants ventured inside the ghetto and smuggled out babies and small children in ambulances and in trams, sometimes wrapped up as packages. 2,500 children were saved. Raoul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat and humanitarian, while serving as Sweden's special envoy in Budapest between July and December 1944, stood strong and saved tens of thousands of Jews from German Nazis and Hungarian fascists while in German-occupied Hungary. Many were children. Retzo Katzner, a Hungarian Jewish journalist and lawyer, bravely negotiated with Adolf Eichmann, a senior SS officer, for 1,648 Jews, among them many children, to escape from occupied Europe and leave for Switzerland via the Katzner train, rather than be deported to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Chiun Sugihara, a Japanese diplomat to Lithuania, defied his government and helped 6,000 Jews, among them many children, flee Europe by issuing transit visas so they could travel safely through Japanese territory. Luba Trojinskaya. In 1944, after her three-year-old son had been sent to the gas chambers in Auschwitz, Luba was transferred to Bergen-Belsen. Hearing children whimpering and crying on her second night in the camp, she went out to find 54 children ages 2 to 14 that had been dumped from a truck and left to die in the camp. After that night, more children were brought to her for protection, leading up to the April 15, 1945 liberation. Like a shining star of hope, Luba was known as the angel of Bergen-Belsen. And there are others like Oscar Schindler, Lois Gundin, Sir Nicholas Winton, Varian Fry, Johann von Holst, Waitzill and Martha Sharp, among many, many others. Heroic Jews and righteous Gentiles, people of conscience, who stood from every corner across the globe to help rescue and save Jews, hand in hand, like flickers of light, these brave men and women stood for humanity. And some of these heroes were children. Some survived, many did not. But these children were heroes. They were heroes because they defied their circumstance by creating, by writing in their diaries, like Anna Frank, by drawing or scratching out pictures, pictures that told of their unspeakable horrors, by writing poems of hope, poems of hope in a place where the Nazis had tried to kill all hope. Hope in a place where they had essentially lost their childhood. In this darkness alone, these children were heroes. And they have left behind some extraordinary artifacts. And these artifacts have become living testimonials. For they remind us of the innocence, the courage, and the strength of these little beings. 
and they demonstrate the child's unique capacity to hold on to creativity, imagination, hope, to hold on to slivers of life in the midst of darkness. And they are a light that can never be smothered, never be snuffed out. Today, we honor all of the children of the Holocaust, including the survivors who are with us today, and including the memories of those whose futures were denied, including their families and loved ones, and finally, including the brave people who sought to rescue them. Let us listen to one of these testimonials, The Last Butterfly. It was a poem written by Pavel Friedman, who, as a young poet and young adult, was imprisoned in the Theresienstadt concentration camp. He was later deported to Auschwitz, where he did not survive. Yet the poem, the butterfly, symbolizes transformation. It symbolizes that the light will never be extinguished, never forgotten. For we, the living, will bear witness. Imagine being a young Jewish child whose whole world has been shaken, who is no longer allowed to play in public playgrounds, who can no longer go to school, and when people who you thought were your friends would no longer talk to you. Imagine having to wear a yellow star to identify who you were, and imagine being hungry and sick all of the time. Imagine having the Gestapo come to take your parents away never to see them again, or being sent far away from your home to places where you couldn't even speak the language or where you were hidden in some stranger's home. Or imagine the horror of being taken with your parents and transported on a train in a cattle car, overfilled with screaming and starving people, only to arrive in an unknown place where you were pulled out of your parents' grasp and sent to a place where you would be faced with the unimaginable and unspeakable. Imagine if only you could survive this, if only. Let us now hear from some of those who did manage to survive, the then brave and courageous children who in spite of everything they witnessed and experienced in their youth, have had an inner strength and courage of conviction to educate all of us by sharing a bit of themselves. It is to them that we show a debt of gratitude and appreciation and our everlasting love. I am Helen Borenstein and I am 97 years old. I was in seven concentration camps I was liberated by the British forces. My name is Al Botner. I'm a child survivor from Belgium and spent three years in a Belgian convent in a city called Liège. My name is Sue Figdor and I'm 89 years old. I'm from Brno, Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia at the time and Hitler came in 1938, and we escaped in 1941. My name is Rivka Glatz, and I'm 83 years old. I was seven years old at Bergen-Belsen, and I was liberated when I was seven and a half. From the camp, I went to Switzerland. I was uh, 20 years old when I came to America. My name is Marlies Gluck, and I'm 80 years old. 
I was two years old when I was hidden with a Christian family and I was picked up by my parents the day of liberation on a bicycle. <laughs> my name is Erna Grace. I am 90 years old. I was one of the 10,000 kinder transport children who were rescued prior to World War II. I went by train to the Hook of Holland and by boat to Harwich on my own. My name is Jeanette Hirsch and I'm 93 years old. And I was between the ages of 12 and 16 during the Holocaust. My name is Peter Konstam and I'm over 84 years old. I was six years old when we had to flee um, Amsterdam in the Netherlands in 1942. After we were saved and walking for a, uh, almost a year through Europe, uh, we landed in Argentina a year later. I'm Susie Konikov, I'm 79 years old. I was nine months old when I was hidden by my Dutch family, whose name is the Van Hakerens. After two and a half years with them, I was sent to Amsterdam, Holland, where I was reunited with my parents. I came to America when I was almost seven years old. That was April 3rd, 1948. I'm Felicia Lieben and I'm 86 years old. I was eight years old when I was hidden. When my mother came back, I was uh, 11 years old. I came to the United States when I was 12 years old. My name is Hildy Mandel. I am 97. I was born and raised in Poland. When the Nazis came in, I was around 16 years old. They were throwing us out from one place into another place. So I never stayed really in one place. My name is Helga Melmet. I am 93 years old. I was in the camps and in the ghetto when I was 13 years old. I was liberated when I was 17. My name is Robin Rappaport. I'm 79 years old. My mother and my aunt and I fled Glumbucky, Poland when I was six months old. I was 15 years old when I came to the United States. My name is Marcus DeRoe. I am 86 years old, first in a ghetto, then we ran away from the train to Auschwitz. The Germans came, caught my brother and shot him. I survived, found my parents, and then for the last six months, we were hiding at a house near our town. And that's my revenge. My name is Sigmund Tobias and I'm 88 years old. I was six years old when my father was imprisoned in the Dachau concentration camp. I arrived in Shanghai when I was six, and I lived there for about 10 years till I was 15 when I came to the United States. My name is Paul R. Temer, and I will be 85 years old. I was nine years old when I was in the Budapest ghetto. I was 11 years old when I came to the United States. We are the children. 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 